everybody is hearing about you because of the kettle and because of right. the amazing story and the book that you wrote called the, the Dream King. And I do want right. to get to it, but I'm afraid that people might just be dismissing another really important part of your life because they're just not hearing about it, which is mm -hmm. that you're a marketplace person. You're a minister, yes. but you also teach at Christ for the Nations. And, yeah. and maybe you could just talk, because that's what I was connecting with you on the first time that we met was more of the mm -hmm. Seven Mountain message, because I was even picking your brain on what some of the books are that you use. And, you know, yeah. I just want to keep that on the front burner, because I think it, it gives you a perspective of the other pieces that are in this that, that a lot of ministers just don't have enough hours, you know, thinking about it like you have, and, and that that's really helping with that whole teaching anointing you have and the whole ability to communicate because you spent so many time and hours in front of people. So maybe just tell them a little bit about what you do at Christ for the Nations. Yeah, so seven years I've been the director and the chair of the Marketplace Leadership Major. Uh, Dutch, when he took over uh, Christ for the Nations about nine years ago, he, he, worked, he, was, he was executive director for two. But he brought me in for a conversation. He said, you know, Will, I want to go after these different spheres of influence. And right now we have the, the, the third year major for the family. We got a third year major for youth ministry. We got a third year major for, for, you know, for pastoral. He said, but I want to do something about going after the business now. I said, well, Dutch, most of the kids when they graduate, they're going to go work somewhere before they go to quote unquote go into ministry. Right. But there are some of them know, who know they're called to go do it. Well, instead of calling it the business now, why don't you call it the marketplace major and let's raise up young people who will sit at the marketplace of ideas. He said, let's talk. And then I wound up talking myself into a job without knowing it. And so <laughs> I stayed there seven years. And, uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's what's what I've done for seven years, leading this marketplace leadership major. So we got these kids, yeah, that want to go to the 1040 window and go to those unreached people groups, you know, in that longitude, latitude, 1040 window that missiologists talk about. But then also, I believe there's a nine to five window. Amen. There's a nine to five window. I think it's one of the largest unreached people groups. And we have young people now who know they're called into that place. And they want, they want to not just save souls, but they also want to become problem solvers to society. They want to get going to all the different spheres of influence. And they want to uh, transform society and reform culture. Yeah. And thank God for Lance for getting that message out oh, there the yeah. way he has. And living it, you know, still living it. And I'm not meaning to be critical of anybody, but... Uh, being in the New York area here, I meet a lot of business people that don't feel like they're fully uh, right. uh, uh, fully celebrated in their churches. It's almost like they're tolerated for their business skill, but they can feel a little like a second class spiritually, second class yeah. citizen. Because, you know, if you really love the Lord, you'd go to grad school and get, and, you know, get your MDiv yeah, and go in the ministry. Exactly. There's this one gentleman, I remember hearing this story about him, he's a He's, a, he's an architect. He's one of the best architects in, in his trade. And he heard somebody uh, preach for, for one of the first, first times he ever heard anybody preach a marketplace message where he felt validated. He comes to the preacher crying. Here's what he said. He said, sir, when I was a young boy, when I was eight years old, I was in prayer and the Lord told me that I was up, that he's raising me up to be an architect. He said, I ran downstairs to tell my father, who was a pastor of a church, he said, my dad told me, son, God doesn't call people to be architects. Go back upstairs and pray again. <laughs> he goes back upstairs and he prays, and the Lord says to him, I'm calling you to be an architect. Right. He runs back down and tells his dad. His dad says, son, get back upstairs and you go pray. <laughs> Sounds like Eli. He go, yeah, he goes back up. The Lord tells him, you're going to be an architect. He runs downstairs. He says, dad, he, he called me to preach. And so his dad tried to groom him and make him into this preacher, he failed miserably. Mm, right. uh, long story short, he, he finally uh, uh, goes, to, goes to school, uh, gets a bachelor's degree in architecture, and thrives in it to the place to where God just, I mean, just all these doors open. He becomes, just a, he becomes a guy who disciples, and, and uh, all these other great architects become his apprentice. I mean, he's amazing what he does. But he said he would drive to work crying sometimes going, God, one of these days, I'm going to go back into ministry. I'm so sorry for Ooh. disobeying. Ooh. Yeah. yeah, because the church had done that to him. That, that, that was, but he said, after he heard that message, he said, it's the first time I've ever felt validated right. and accepted my calling to do what I'm doing. Amen. He was a godly man, 
ran his business, ran his uh, practice with you know godly uh, principles, all that. But uh, because of that religious mindset that people had, see, if it hadn't been for people in the marketplace, slavery would have never ended. So yeah, because of Wilberforce, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, Wilberforce, right? Who, who's the politician? Matter of fact, John Wesley talks to Wilber Wilberforce wanted to be a preacher. And so his last, John Wesley's last letter, like Paul writing to Timothy, his last letter, he writes to Wilberforce. He says, I believe God's called you to be a reformer and to, uh, and, and, and to go into politics. And who knows, maybe you will even be the person that, that will shut down the, viol the violence of slavery, the one over in America. And so it was that last letter before he died. Wilberforce reads that and he goes into politics. Also too, Harry Beecher Stowe, people forget about her. She writes a little book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. She's uh, in prayer one day. Her father was this powerful revival preacher. She couldn't speak that well, but she was an amazing writer. And she's uh, taking communion one day. And all of a sudden, she has an open vision. And she sees a slave being beat to death for sneaking off to pray. She said she dropped her wafer in the, in the cup. She ran home. And she started writing the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Wow. She said her, 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 her hand couldn't keep up with all the, all the thoughts that were coming to her mind. Then she finds out that, a, that the house across the street from her was connected to the Underground Railroad. Wow. So, run, so runaway escaped slaves start sharing their stories with her about what is happening to, a, to the South. She sells 300,000 books in like three or four months. Wow. She sold 2 million bootleg copies huh. of that book around the world. It had so much influence that in Germany, there's still a bridge over there that says Uncle Tom's Cabin in German. And so... Uh, and so when Abraham Lincoln meets her, it said that when he met her, he said, so this is the little woman who began the big war. He shook wow. her hand. Wow. So the theater at that time was in people's minds. So that book is what subpoenaed the consciousness of, of the whole nation. Where are the marketplace people today? Wow. Who are going to who are going to tell the stories, who are going to write the screenplays, who are going to do the next whatever that is going to subpoena the consciousness of the whole nation. I believe God wants to raise up a prophetic creative Amen. collective. Come on. So we'll do, a, we'll do a yeah. separate call on Marketplace. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, All right. I want people to hear the story of, of yes. the, dream, the Dream King. But could you just do me a favor and release a prayer for the audience? If people uh, have yeah. felt tolerated instead of celebrated, yes. and if, if we haven't really recognized the gift of all the business people and all, all you know, political, all the different realms other than the church realm, I think we need some healing going on. Oh, yeah. So right now, Father, I, I, just, I just bless right now every person that has not felt validated in their marketplace assignment, in their marketplace calling. Lord, I thank you that they don't need a pulpit and a microphone to change the world. God, I thank you, Lord, for what they're doing in that cube. God, I thank you for what they're doing, Lord, in that cubicle. God, I thank you, Lord, what they're doing behind that counter. Amen. I thank you for what they're doing, Lord, in that suit. Lord, wherever sphere of influence that they're in, however they're mm -hmm. representing you, yeah. God, I thank you for the influence of the kingdom being released to them. Lord, maybe they're saying, but God, I'm the only Christian in my workplace. But Lord, if they're the only Christian in the workplace, they're the highest spiritual authority in the workplace. Amen. God, I thank you for the, an anointing for dream interpretations, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, words of revelation in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. God, I thank you that you give them so much authority on their words. It's like E.F. Hutton. When, when they talk, people listen mm -hmm. because they have words that are like apples of gold and settings of silver so that people can taste and see that the Lord is good. I thank you, Lord, for words of wisdom and words of knowledge, Lord, for not, not only uh, broken backs, but also for broken systems Amen. in the name of Jesus, that they will become problem solvers in their workplace, problem solvers in their communities, problem solvers, Lord, that, 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 that take responsibility for what's happening in their midst because, Lord, you release influence to those who take responsibility. And I bless them Amen. and I break off rejection. Amen. I break off. Uh, every other hindering thing, uh, hope deferred that's made their hearts sick. And God, I thank you for them being celebrated and not tolerated in their calling from this day forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. And you were about thank to you. prophesy over, over the marketplace. Why don't you just release that word, if you remember? Yes, God. So I, I call forth right now yeah. the prophetic creative amen. collective. Can amen. I tell you where that's coming from for me? I was in a hotel room. I was uh, I, I was waiting for uh, waiting for my time to speak. I wound up watching a five-hour-long documentary about Steven Spielberg. 
<laughs> and uh, but the thing is, you couldn't talk about Steven Spielberg in the documentary without also talking about Francis Ford Coppola, Brian De Palma, Martin Scorsese, and George Lucas. And it turns out all those guys hung out there together. They would hang out on each other's couches. They would they would uh, uh, look over each other's screenplays. They would offer critiques of their work. Sometimes they made money off of each other. Sometimes they didn't. Like uh, uh, in, in one movie, uh, Scarface, uh, uh, Steven Spielberg actually took a cameraman's credit in that movie because he wanted to help his friend get the last scene when Al Pacino falls over the balcony. He wanted to help him get that scene just right. So he took the screen after Gil's minimum just to be a cameraman because he wanted to help his friend with that. So you couldn't talk about Spielberg without talking about mm, the, this, this yeah. collective of filmmakers. I start weeping while I'm looking at that and I go, God, where is my prophetic creative collective? And I think that's what God is raising up. God is raising up a prophetic creative collective. Amen. I'm gonna, even out of your church, so it's coming a prophetic creative collective of a diversity of not just the gifts of the spirits, the gifts, of the, the gifts, talents, and abilities God is using. There's going to be this synergy, unity through diversity. People are going to be sleeping on couches. People are going to be sleeping on floors. Uh, screenplays, uh, uh, new uh, new bills, new starts, entrepreneurial endeavors. I just see us just a, a just a, 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 an explosion of creativity that, that, that wants to take place. So, Father, I prophesy that right now. Over this fellowship, in the name of Jesus, the prophetic creative collective, the apostolic creative collective, this Christian creative collectives, Lord, there in New Jersey, there in that area. God, I thank you for them coming forth, Lord, in finance. I thank you for them coming forth, Lord, in every sphere of influence. And, and also, uh, I see things happening on Broadway. I see things happening in movies, other, other, other places. Lord, I thank you for this prophetic creative collective of entrepreneurs, Lord, of, of all different types in the marketplace. This marketplace explosion happened of creative ideas in the midst of crisis to become problem solvers to society, to, to, to shape this new America. America that's about to come forward in Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Thank you. That was good. Good word. Amen.